In a prior video, I talked about different means in which to carry out scientific investigations. I covered different approaches which range from the controlled experiments that you'll find a physicist performing to the observational methods a social scientist or an economist may employ. One of the themes that ran through the different approaches was control over the variables. Classical experiments provide control over the independent variable but offer different levels of control over other variables depending on your methods. The observational methods, however, do not provide control over any variables, at least in a traditional sense. And there is the nice in-between, which is the natural experiment or quasi-experiment, a situation where the naturally occurring data set just happens to look as if an experimenter manipulated the independent variable. But how does the researcher control for something? In a lab, it can be simple. We can just do our best to make sure that the variables do not change, or alternatively, we can just measure it. If we take an expression along the lines of y of x and t is equal to axt, where a is some parameter, x is the independent variable, and the temperature t is another factor determining the dependent variable. If we want to find the parameter a, we could just vary the iv whilst keeping the temperature constant. Alternatively, we measure t and we could adjust it such that we divide the dependent variable by the recorded temperature such that our expression for the dependent variable becomes y of x and t over t is equal to a x where y of x and t over t then becomes the dependent variable which is essentially the same thing as t being held constant as one now there are other approaches we can take for example we take the results from an x-ray fluorescent experiment i did as an undergraduate the aim of this investigation was to create a model which allowed us to identify the composition of different alloys in the experiments we bombard a material with x-rays which excites the electrons in the material shortly after excitation the electrons relax back to their ground state and emit an x-ray photon. The energy of the photon is characteristic of the material. Now here's the raw data from different targets. We have silver, zirconium, and indium. Now I have selected these spectra as they clearly show a problem. We have these peaks that show up everywhere, so we wonder what gives? Now these peaks look like they are characteristic emission lines of tungsten, and this makes sense as the x-rays are produced by firing electrons at a tungsten target inside of our x-ray tube. So we could expect this pattern to appear if we just measured the x-ray beam directly, and when we do that we get this spectrum. So we have this background, and we need to control for that, and we need to describe this background to do so. From the theory, we know that there are three components to the signal we see here. There are Bremsstrahlung, responsible for this one-upon energy dependence described by Kramer's law. Now, we won't go into the origin, just Google it. It is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have a sigmoid function, which comes from the X-ray attenuation due to the window of our X-ray tube, and this sigmoid function attenuates the Bremsstrahlung. Finally, we have these three peaks. Now to control for the peaks, we have to characterize them. To do that properly, we have to remove the attenuated Bremsstrahlung, which is the product of Kramer's law and a sigmoid function. The resultant function is shown by the green dotted line. We can then fit a function which comprises three Gaussian functions. Now these fits are pretty good, but they're not great. But no matter, the fitting parameters will serve as a good starting point for our fitting routine when we combine the peaks with the Bremsstrang. And we now have a description for the background and we can subtract it from the other spectra. However, we do still need a scaling factor. But once we've applied this, then we can subtract the background and therefore control for it. Now this new data set then looks as follows. We have silver before the adjustment and after the adjustment zirconium before the adjustment and after the adjustment, and an indium before and after. We can now fit the peaks to characterize these materials in further detail, but I will leave it here as this is not what this video is about, and it is an active coursework assignment in one of the modules I'm involved with, so I'm not going to give away the answers. Now this is another example of how we can control for different features of the dataset. To most, this looks pretty complicated, but this is something that an undergraduate student is expected to be able to do.
Control is a bit trickier when it comes to observational methods, and it requires a lot of testing. Control of your independent variable is easy. You just take whatever it is that you decide the IV to be, and you stick that on the x-axis of your graph. However, the other factors that may determine your dependent variable can be a bit trickier. Ideally, the other factors are linearly independent from the others, and with that I mean that uh, the change in one factor does not result in a change of the other factor, or they are orthogonal. But let's consider consumer behavior, for example. It is very likely that we will have to control for age and sex. And this is relatively simple, as your age is not going to change what chromosomes you have. Now, in this case, controlling for these is easy, as you just treat them as your second independent variable. However, when the cofactors are not linearly independent, then it can become a bit more difficult. For example, we may have to consider income as well as a factor for our consumer behaviors. In this case, it may be worth Worth considering that income is affected by age and sex. There is a distinct gender gap in income and it is pretty intuitive that income increases with age. So income is not independent of sex and age. You need to figure out how these confounding variables are related. Sometimes this is easy and sometimes this is really hard. Usually in physics we tend to have a very good idea of what these kinds of relationships are. In the statistical sciences this is much harder, if not impossible. Even with an absolutely perfect model applied to our data, which we gathered using observational methods, we can not really establish cause and effect. We can only establish correlation, that is assuming that we don't have a full grasp of the mechanisms and the theory. A classic case of this is an example of the nurture versus nature argument. Now, research has consistently shown that parents reading to their children is positively correlated with the child's IQ. Now, it is very feasible that that the act of reading to your child makes it smarter, but it is also very clear that parents with a higher IQ tend to read more to their children, and there's a definite hereditary component to IQ. Now, we don't understand the mechanisms that are at play here, so it would be silly to make a claim either way, but it seems pretty likely that this relationship actually does go both ways. Another example is the correlation between global average temperatures and carbon dioxide concentrations. We can demonstrate without a doubt that the two are positively correlated, but some climate change deniers will still latch on to the correlation does not imply causation argument. The argument relies on that it is possible that the higher temperatures just result in higher carbon dioxide concentrations. Now the issue is, is that we do understand the mechanisms, so the correlation argument is irrelevant. We know that increasing carbon dioxide concentrations results in increasing temperature, and we know that increasing temperatures result in increasing carbon dioxide concentration, and this is why the whole climate change thing is terrifying. Of course, when we are talking about astronomy, we have a pretty damn good understanding of the theory, and we are in a position where we can happily interchange causation and correlation, within limits of course, but if we don't understand the system well enough, it is pretty risky to talk about causation. And it is important to remember that even if there is a correlation, it can even be just by random chance. But good scientists understand this. To establish causation, we have to perform an experiment, and with that I include some quasi-experiments, where we frame the correlation as a testable hypothesis. As scientists, we have to be cautious as well. We have to do everything in our power to ensure that we have the appropriate controls in place. When we do classical experiments, controlling for all factors is easier than with observational methods. However, the process is not perfect. As scientists, we know that there are inherent flaws in any experiment. However, in the overwhelming majority of times, these flaws are well known and often determined to be irrelevant in a well-performed experiment. But sometimes there are major flaws that come through, and if this is the case, your experiment gets shot down during peer review.
when we use observational methods we are aware that we may not have the full picture and this is one of the reasons why we hammer the point that correlation does not mean causation in both experimental and observational approaches there is an understanding within the community that we must approach data and results with caution provided that we are open and honest with our communication the limitations of an experiment are not a problem as we all know where we stand and we can then figure out the best way forward however a problem does arise when it comes to the wider population whether you're at a university or a private company you can be pretty damn sure that management doesn't let you speak to the press directly you pass on your results to the PR department and they write a saleable article which is picked up by a news aggregator journalists then pick it up to write a piece about it in a paper this piece is then molded by a senior editor before it gets printed in the paper to be read by the uninformed public the problem is that all too often there are no scientists involved in that process and very quickly you can find out your research where you show that there's a correlation between eating vegetables and better health outcomes is going to be portrayed as if bacon is going to kill you three days ago as a member of the public you can inoculate yourself against these kinds of stories by either just ignoring them or reading them carefully and looking into it further if you look beyond the alarmist language you generally will still find phrases such as may cause and is linked to you can then also look at the study itself, but don't just consider sample sizes. Okay, a small sample size is rarely good, but a large sample size is not necessarily much better. You can look at p-values, which indicate if a relationship is statistically significant, but you must then also consider effect size. A certain independent variable may have a statistically significant correlation with the dependent variable, but the effect size may just be negligible. Of course, it is also important to check that the study is fit for purpose as is beautifully demonstrated by an article one of my viewers shared with me in this article the investigators test the efficacy of parachutes through a randomized controlled trial where 23 people jumped from a plane and were randomly assigned a parachute or just a backpack the researchers found that there was no significant difference in deaths or injury rates between the group of course the plane that the participants jumped out of was stationary and on the ground Of course, critically evaluating publications is a skill set on its own, and it requires quite a bit of scientific training to do. However, there are websites where you can go to read the news articles as written by the actual researchers. One great example of this is The Conversation, where rather than journalists writing a piece which is then distorted by a senior editor to create a nice attention-grabbing headline, the researcher writes the article in collaboration with an editor to create a balanced story. The editor ensures that the article is accessible to the public and the researcher ensures that the article is accurate in both the letter and the spirit. So in the past few videos I have discussed the scientific method, experimental methods and how to control variables and stress that we must take caution when communicating our results and reading about other people's results and it is all very well to point a camera at the horizon and conclude that the resultant image is evidence of whatever shape of the earth you are trying to show but you can also just drop an egg in salty water and make some ham-fisted conclusions. All of that is perfectly fine to do without performing any meaningful measures applying reasonable control or performing thorough analyses but do not expect your claim to be taken seriously.